Well, isn't this fun? Wow, welcome everybody. Um, welcome to our health seminar for tonight. Is healthy food actually healthy? And I'm excited to be here. I'm grateful to um, Crystal and Lee for hosting the health seminar this evening. I usually do them in my home where I have my practice. But this is tons of fun. I was raised on a farm, so it's always fun to come back and, um, and do that. How many of you are familiar with the Hidden Pin Creek Farm? Good. Do you love their food? Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Um, tonight, we're going to offer a two-part approach to help answer the question, is healthy food actually healthy? So it's going to come from the standpoint from a naturopath. I'm a naturopathic doctor. And I'm going to give you my take on it. And then we're going to turn it over to Crystal and Lee, where they're going to share all the good stuff about their farm and their point of view from it. So as I said, I'm a naturopathic doctor, and I practice from my home. I, my practice is on Scenic Drive. Just um, we, were, we were discussing how close that is. It's 10 minutes if you go the speed limit, 6 minutes if you speed limit. <laughs> <laughs> so, we're right down by Duck Lake Road. I did it today, so I know. Yeah, so she knows. She knows. Uh -huh. I offer two modalities in my practice. I do cranial sacral therapy. How many of you have ever heard of cranial sacral therapy? A few of you? Great. It's a light touch modality that helps balance your nervous system. And it can be done on anyone from before birth to right before they're passing out of the body. And so it's a great, it's a great thing that helps balance your nervous system. Um, the second thing that I do, which we're going to talk about this evening, is called nutrition response testing. Um, nutrition response testing on your paper, I have a little bit on there if you want the actual definition. But it's a non-invasive system of analyzing a person's body. So it's non-invasive, that's really important, of analyzing the person's body in order to determine, this is real important, in order to determine the underlying causes of the ill health. Now that's pretty good to me, to be able to determine the underlying causes of ill health. And when these are corrected through safe, natural, nutritional means, the body can help repair itself in order to attain and maintain more optimum health. So that's the definition of nutrition response testing. I find it a very, very powerful modality. Um, on your, you have a paper in front of you, and first is the itinerary, and the second is like a sheet of paper that asks you about your health. So at any point, if you would like to just look at that, um, let's look at it right now. It's called Public public education workshop screening form. So I want you to, to look at the first part of that. It gives like five lines. And it asks you what your main complaints would be. And we can't talk about our kids or our, our, our job, but what are your main complaints in your life? So I'm asking you if you would all just think about that. I'm going to ask you um, what is the one thing, if, I could if you could wave a magic wand, over your life, and you could make one thing go away that's actually ruining your life. <coughs> Something that you think, wow, this just really, you get up in the morning, you think about it, you go to bed, you think about it, or um, it's getting in the way of things that you want to do in your life. Maybe you want to be more active with your children and your grandkids, maybe you want to take trips that you can't take anymore. So I'm asking you to think right now. Think in your mind of one thing that if you could wave a magic wand, what one thing would you want to go away that has to do with your health, your life? Doesn't matter if doctors said it could never go away. Doesn't matter. So everybody has something in mind, maybe? Maybe? So I want to tell you a little bit about when I was younger, how things ruined my life or came to ruin my life and how it pushed me into becoming a naturopathic doctor. So when I was in um, high school, I decided to stop eating 
uh, breakfast and lunch, and so I was only eating dinner. And at that, it wasn't very much. I would come home in the fir from having done sports and having done um, walking the distance from home to from school to home. And uh, the first thing that would come out of my mouth was, "Mom, what's for dessert?" So I was real into sugar, and that was probably my favorite thing. Don't know if any of you have ever had that in your life, but um, my, my favorite thing to eat was sugar. And so by the time I was a senior in high school, from, I'm assuming it was because I was eating like that, um, my joints started to hurt. So I'm only, what, 18? And pretty soon my joints are hurting. I had to drop out of track, couldn't run anymore. And um, then later on, I, I became ill with chronic fatigue, and that was real difficult. I couldn't remember that I even had kids in my house. That was a scary thing. My energy level was next to nothing, and I somehow got through that. And then later I was um, diagnosed with Lyme disease, and that was a huge hit on my body. And I remember um, being very aware of that. I was a health. Um, the medical director at a, at a survival school, and I was aware of what Lyme disease looked like. Uh, the kids would, about three to four kids a, a summer, would come down with Lyme disease, and so I was very familiar taking them to the ER and having that, that diagnosed. So when I had that happen, um, it hit, hit extremely hard. I couldn't get out of bed anymore. I couldn't walk and I, I felt like there was a, a beam stuck in my head. It was just constant, serious pain. My joints hurt uh, even just to touch. And my thinking, what was left, had completely gone. I had to drop out of school, uh, college, and um, it, took, it took me down to a space in my life with the inability to think and communicate, people would talk to me, and I couldn't come up with words to be able to respond. It was extremely embarrassing. And I remember um, uh, just coming to a space within me and saying, this is life. This is what life is. And you get real humble when you can't think. And so that was a real impact on my life. And so then uh, I have uh, a son who was then diagnosed with juvenile diabetes and type 1. And I would say that was the thing that pushed me over the edge, that I said I've really got to get serious and decide what it is that I can do to help my life and, um, and help my son's life. And that would be, in my opinion, the impetus that pushed me forward to become a naturopathic doctor, to be able to help others in a natural way, to be able to get your health in order, to be able to not have to rely on the medical drugs and intervention as much as possible. And so as you can see, I'm making my way back. I can now put a couple words together. I can walk. Um, my joints don't hurt um, when I'm really stressed, then I get a little joint pain. But for the most part, I am, I am getting better. But I would have to say the one thing that helped me the most, the one thing that helped me the most that continues and continues and continues to help me is nutrition response testing. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. I travel, I travel to Ann Arbor every other week to see a practitioner who does what I do six minutes away. And so it's helped me. It's, it's a very powerful, powerful modality. It was created by a gentleman by the name of Fred Eulen, who's a chiropractor, who he himself was 23 hours in bed, very ill, and he needed help. He didn't know what to do. He couldn't find help that was getting him anywhere. He finally um, put together, he studied Chinese, Japanese, and German medicine, a little bit of American, put together things that worked, brought his health back to now when people come into my office, I have a video of Fred Ewan playing, and he looks pretty darn vibrant, wouldn't you say, when you yeah. see him? He's a beautiful man, and he has done um, incredible amounts for people, for humanity. So when he had his practice in upstate New York, 
and he was um, he was better now, and, and his clients were getting better using nutrition response testing. The MDs and the DOs started sending their their family to him, uh, and so they were getting better. And so then at nighttime, when nobody would see, the doctors would come and have Freddie help them doing nutrition response testing until there came a point when the doctor said, would you please teach this to us so that we could do this for our clients, for our patients. And Freddie said yes. And so many of us have been trained, many doctors have been trained to do this nutrition response testing. So I'm going to tell you something that you probably don't know. Maybe some of you do know. Um, um, I'm visual, so I'm going to just draw it up here. So I want you to know this. Can everybody see my little arch? Kind of, sort of. It's just, it's just a poorly drawn half circle. <laughs> OK. And so this right here is 70%. Can everybody see that? 70%, maybe I should hold it up. Can you hold it? No, that's okay, thanks. So 70%. So did you know, did you know that by the time you have symptoms, usually takes between 20, for adults, usually between 20 and 40 years for a person to start to experience symptoms. Now we have little babies and young ones who are experiencing symptoms already, and that's a whole different story. We come about Pottinger's cats, about that. But for the average adult, it takes about 20 to 40 years before you start experiencing symptoms. By the time you experience symptoms, about 70% of your organs are on their way out. People don't know that. How many of you knew that? Maybe one of you is good. Yeah. Terry knows that. He was, knows that. So that's a very important piece of information, wouldn't you say? Oops, 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 oops. So by the time by the time your body is experiencing symptoms, 70% of the <coughs> organs are already on their way out. <clears throat> So what would you say if I told you that with nutrition response testing, we could, we could change, we could turn those symptoms around, not in 40 years, not in 30 years, not in 20 years, or even 10, but with nutrition response testing, pretty consistently we're able to turn the symptoms around in one to five years. That's pretty good. Wouldn't you agree? Wouldn't you agree? That's pretty darn good. That's why Freddie Yulin used it. That's why people came to learn it. And um, that's why I use it. And I feel very, very honored to be able to offer that to, to our community. And so this right here is the symptoms. This is what people you generally come to their doctor for. Or this is what they suffer for sil with silently. Whatever your symptom is. And so when you come, you can see there's a triangle here and down here is called nutritional deficiency. And over here is organ dysfunction. And so <clears throat> the way that it works is I look at the deficiency that's happening to your body nutritionally. So when people, you can put sugar up here or bad food, but this is symptoms this time. So. When a person's body is deficient in nutrition, the organs start to dysfunction. Does that make sense? That makes sense. Good. So the only thing that the body needs, the body, as well as water, etc., but it needs whole, whole food. Whole food. That, what is whole food? Whole food is when you pick it. You grow it in the garden, you milk it, that's whole food. It's the way that it was when, when it originated. And so what I look at is I look, you come to me and we find out what's the nutritional deficiency. Hello, Katie. This is Sophie. <laughs> yeah. um, 
So nutritional deficiency will absolutely cause your organs to dysfunction. Then you come up with symptoms, and it's just a big cycle. I'm going to say Sophie's a patient of yours. Sophie is a patient. Yeah. That's better. Yeah. That's better. Yeah. Um, so this is what happens. So when you come to me, we need to break this cycle. Wouldn't you agree? So I want to, I want to find out what is the nutritional deficiency, what organs are dysfunctioning, and over time the symptoms just disappear. So when you come to me, I, don't, I ask you what your symptoms are, but that's not what I'm even looking at. I'm finding out what's going on down here. And sometimes it's, it, it's a, it, people start noticing a reduction in symptoms quickly. Sometimes it takes longer. Depends on how far down this you've gone. So, when you come to, when you come to me, we don't cover up your symptoms with duct tape. How many of you have ever experienced that? Symptoms being covered up with duct tape. What does that mean? That means you go to someone, maybe you go to your medical doctor, you go to somebody with symptoms and they say, oh, we can do something that will stop those symptoms. That will kind of cover that over. We'll make, we'll make, we'll make that, uh, if you're draining, you have, a, a, you, know, you have a lot of drainage coming out, you go to the doctor, they give you something to stop that drainage. They, they cover up that symptom. When you come to me, I go, oh, yay, well done, you're draining. <laughs> right? Yes. It's coming out of you, well done. <laughs> That's really great. So just like you wouldn't drive down the road and your, and your check engine light comes up, you wouldn't put a piece of duct tape over that, right? Which is what happens a lot in our medical community. I, I, um, with us, we don't cover up the, the symptoms. We are trying to find out what's causing it, or we are getting to the core of it. Um, so real quickly, I want to express what we do with nutrition response testing. And I'm going to eventually ask a volunteer to come up, so hopefully somebody will want to volunteer and come up. So what we do in nutrition response testing is we're looking, I have all my little drawings. <coughs> when a person comes to us, there are areas of their body that, that may be um, not functioning optimally. And when they come, we're actually looking for different categories to be able to see what's causing, what might be causing the issue. And so, just real quickly, we have common foods is a big one. For those of you who come to me, how many of you have experienced common foods being a huge issue? Hey, yeah. So common foods, which Crystal and Lee are going to talk about, what's, wh how, what does the quality of food have to do with how well you are? We have immune challenges that we look at. Maybe you have a virus or a parasite. Maybe you have bacteria. Maybe you have fungus going on in something that's actually causing the issue. We look at metal toxicities. Who can tell me where we get metal toxicity? Filling. Pardon? Fillings. 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 Mercury. Anybody else think of metal toxicity? Water. 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 Deodorant. Fish. Fish. All sorts of places. Where you live, what you breathe. Uh, chemical toxicities. Where would we get chemical toxicities? Who can think of that? Everywhere. Everywhere? Yeah. <laughs> Those smellies you put into your, your socket to make your house smell fragrant. Those are, actual, those are actual chemicals, toxicities. Um, what we put on our skin. What you put on your skin, that's a big one, Karen. That's a huge one. You can get it from food, too. I mean, pesticides. Absolutely. Yeah, you can get, you can get it big time from food. You can get it hugely from the food, yeah. And so, the last one is scars. Scars are something that few people are aware of that can actually cause your nervous system to not be operating optimally. You have a nervous system, and when you have a slice across that, the impulses can gather in that scar 
and cause all sorts of dysfunction. So this is one of the biggest ones that we have. Freddie Ulan says, if you don't handle the scars, don't handle anything else. It's that important. So these are the things we're actually looking for. We're not looking at a Band-Aid. We're actually trying to find the core of what's going on with you, why you have those symptoms. And so I'm going to ask, um, let's see, who's not a client and who would like to come up and come on up? Very good. Thank you. Yay. Okay. So tell me your name again. June. June. Is it okay if you're being videoed? I don't care. Okay, good. <laughs> so June, can't, tell me where the camera is. <laughs> so June know, knows my parents, and so I, I recognize them right away. So, so June comes to me, or June, June has some symptoms that, uh, that she's dealing with, and she comes and she tells me what they are, and I go, thank you for telling me. And so the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to actually see if I can test her. Is June testable? And so just like the pediatrician does and did when you took your children to them and they used a rubber mallet, remember that when they hit your knee and the knee went like this? Do you guys remember that? The leg went like that? So that doctor was actually testing the integrity of your nervous system. Did you know that? Few of us know that. And so that's what the doctor's actually doing. They're seeing if there is a connection. So you have your brain, yeah, most of us, right? You still have it. Usually. Down your spinal cord, and then you have all, all the nerves that shoot out from your spinal cord. So you have messages coming out, going out here, you touch something hot, the message sends back, right? So there's a circuit. We all agree with that? There's a circuit that goes from your brain to an external or to an organ and comes back. So I'm looking to see if the circuits are broken. That's what your pediatrician was looking for. Is the circuit broken on Johnny? When they hit the leg, bam, great. When they hit the leg and nothing happens, that's a red flag. Because the doctor says this circuit is broken somewhere. We all agree with that? That's what that doctor was doing. Okay, so I don't have a rubber mallet. It could get painful so, in my testing. So I choose to use a locked muscle. That's what I choose to use. Instead of a, a reflex, I'm using a different kind of an area. So I'm looking to see if a muscle has the integrity to lock. I'm not looking to see how strong you are, just simply what the, what the integrity is of the muscle to lock. And so I'm going to ask June, if you, do you have any shoulder issues? Mm, no, not really. Good. Okay, so you're going to face me. And so have you ever done this before? No. Good. Okay, that's always the most fun. So arm comes out and you keep that elbow straight. So again, I'm not testing to see if she is strong. I'm testing to see if her nervous system has the integrity to have a locked muscle. Okay, so I'm going to press down and you're just going to match my pressure. Okay, so match my pressure. Good. So, she's, there, there should be a, a slight sensation, maybe, right about right here. So match my pressure again, June. So where do you feel that? Down here, up here? Up here. Good. That's called a lock. What's that called? <coughs> a lock. Good. Very good. So let's do it again. So match my pressure. Good, you feel that? Good, what's that called? Lock. Good, so she's got that down. So the way that we can tell if we're accessing the nervous system is we have a pole with our finger, positive and negative. You can use anything. You can, you can actually do it anywhere. But for ease, I don't use the hammer, and I'm not trying everywhere. We just press on the arm, and I'm going to now put my finger right here, if, she, if you'll let me, That's right here on the bridge of her nose, and on one side, we have the lock, good. And on this side, I break the circuit, and her arm goes down. Just like. <laughs> did you feel that? Yes, so, I did. So match my pressure, good. And then I switch it around, and it goes right down. So am I? Are you trying? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. So let's try it one more time. So there she has a lock, and then I switch it over, and it just drops right down. So that tells me that I'm accessing June's nervous system. 
So then the next thing that I do is I want to find out what area of her body is actually stressed. Okay? So what I'm going to do is if I we use we use reflex areas to access different points on her body. So if I press on that area and that area is stressed, that's the same as when the doctor hit the, the thing and it doesn't go. So it tells us that there's a lock, or a, a, um, the circuit is broken. So again, tell me if I, if I touch on a certain area on June's head and the arm drops down, that's the circuit is broken. Do you get that? So if I press on her head and her arm drops down, what the circuit is what? Broken. 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 Good. If I press on this area and the arm stays strong, is the circuit broken? No. 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 Good. So here we go. So I'm just going to go to different areas of June. Do you mind if I do that? No. no. Well, too late now, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm testing different reflex points on June. I'm waiting for for the arm to go down. So the arm went down in that area. And so that tells me that this area that I just tested, that there's a stressor there. The circuit is broken. And I want to find out how we can help that. So what we do with nutrition response testing is we use whole food supplements. Um, how many of you have ever seen a deer eating out in the woods? Yeah? How about a rabbit? Have you ever wondered why they don't die from what they eat. They only eat the good stuff. They, they only eat, but how do they know what the good stuff is? It's an innate intelligence. Your body knows innately what to eat. So a lot of times people say when they bring their children to the grocery that um, the child just starts picking. And I'm not talking about Doritos. I'm talking when you're in the, the part of the grocery, that ha the outside of the grocery store that has the whole more whole foods. Children are, have been known to pick the foods that they're needing. That's an innate intelligence. That's how the rabbits know what to eat so they don't die. And so we have products made um, by Standard Process, and it's uh, a company that grows their food, they process it, and then they, they send it right to us. It's the whole food. It's the whole package. And so as opposed to synthetic supplements, how many of you are familiar with synthetic supplements? A few of you. So have you ever heard the word synthetic supplements? Synthetic supplements are when the people in the lab take this part and this part and this part and then they put it together to make something that your body no longer recognizes. So we're using the stuff that your body recognizes. So I'm just going to try something on June real quickly and I never know what's going to show up on people. And so, I don't know, let's try this, June. Okay, so if her body likes this, what do you think will happen to her arm? It'll lock. Good. So, arm goes out, and I really don't know. We'll try this one. You're just going to hold this for me. Good. So match my pressure. Good. And so we're going to go back to this point that her arm went down on and match my pressure. So. I can't push down any harder than that, her arm locks. So what does that tell you about this product? Her body wants it. Her body wants that. And so I'm going to show you something. So I need you to hold this one, and the arm goes up. Good. Let's check this one out. So I match my pressure. And her arm goes right down. And so what is this called? <coughs> This is called. I can't read it. Anymore. No. <laughs> it's called prostate PMG. So, do you think that June needs that? <laughs> Probably not. So, the point being that your body can tell what it needs. Does June have a prostate? We don't think no. so. So, her body wouldn't need it. Is what the point is. Thank you, June. Appreciate that. Yeah. So. So that's how we do what we do. People come, we, we um, look for areas that are stressed, and then we figure out what it is that they're needing to help. Do you want to explain real quick how, the, how that works? Like how the, what works? Like the sunshine through a window? Like the Can do that, absolutely. Yeah. So whole food has energy to it. 
Do you guys believe that? Yeah? So the sun has energy. You're by the window, and the energy comes through, and you feel the heat even though it's that distance away. Everything has measurable energy. And so when we put this up against a person or an area, the body can tell if it wants it or not, the energy of it. And so that's, that's what that is. And so... Yeah. 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 It looks like I can just hold it and you'll be fine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did you hear her? She says, it looks like you could just hold it and be fine. Um, <laughs> so you walk around with all your <laughs> um, um, That may be true to, to a degree. However, it's really good to help start fixing the organ problem that we're having. So, but, but why not, right? Why not wear your, why not wear your supplements? I think people that would tape them to their body. Tape them to their body? Yeah. There you go. If you're trying to say, you know, cut back. Okay. <laughs> if you're trying to cut back, is that what you said? Yeah. <laughs> so again, I want to emphasize that this is not a Band-Aid to cover symptoms. It's actually finding the root cause, the root core of something. Um, today, I, I didn't know if you, if you knew this, um, there are more American children on some form of pharmaceutical drug than ever before. You guys aware of that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, just to make you aware. All in the attempt, what, to control the child in some way, to help some kind of issue that they're having, they're either too lo loud or too wild, they come two times an hour and a half each. The first one is called an initial consultation, and I get information from you. I do a real thorough body scan. Then the second time you come for an hour and a half, I write up a report of findings. Those three hours with me, that's normally 150. When you come here, you get it for 45. You're welcome to just come in here and get the scan if you want. But for those of you who want to go a little step further, there's no obligation whatsoever. But what have you got to lose? Just telling you. If you have something that's ruining your life, if you want to be healthier for yourself, for your grandkids, for your own self, I just encourage you, raise your hand at the end, and we'll just go real quickly in there, and I'll give you a two-minute scan. If anybody wants to go while we're doing this, that's fine, too. Oh, I, that's OK. We'll wait. I, I want them to see what you have to do. So, so I want to thank you for listening to what I do, but I want to turn it over to Lee and Crystal. And um, I love what they offer. Their food is great. Has anybody ever had their goat's milk? <laughs> I've never had goat's milk before till last week. That is light eggnog, I'm telling you guys. That is really good stuff. So thank you everyone. All right, so we just kind of have a slideshow that we put together. Um, and then I have some things that I want to talk about with everybody. A lot of familiar faces, some new ones. Um, so I'm going to wait until we get about it. Everybody knows Lee my husband. So this is, um, we moved here in 2015. Yeah. Um, so it's going to be our fourth year. Fourth or fifth. Uh, four, or fifth, fifth year, year fifth farming. Fifth year farming here. So we've done a lot already, but we still have a lot of big plans. So we hope you'll stick around and <laughs> watch all of our changes. But I wanted to start talking about um, what we do and why it's important um, and why what we do is different than what you would get at the grocery store or different farms. Um, so <coughs> I think everybody has a copy of this or not? I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. okay. Why is it important to support local farms and what impacts will it have on your community? <coughs> so many small scale farms are less likely to use pesticides herbicides, synthetic fertilizers, and um, more commonly their livestock is steroid-free, antibiotic-free, hormone-free, and more likely to be um, fed non-GMO feed. Let's see what we got here. So, same thing I just kind of talked about here. And all the pictures on the slideshow are all taken from the farm. Um, and then local farms are also less likely to use um, CAFOs, which is confined animal feeding operations. So if you ever drive down uh, country roads, you'll see those big, big houses. You never see any animals from. Well, that's where all your milk comes from, your egg comes from, your pork comes from. So pretty much anything you get from Myers or the grocery store comes from 
big warehouse like that packed full of animals. So. Let's see. So this is a picture of some of our dairy goats. Uh, they're grazing in the front pasture. Uh, why is it important to feed an animal a species appropriate diet? <clears throat> So if we were going to feed our cows like they feed cows um, in a big dairy, uh, the silage that they get, all that ground up feed, and they stuff it in bags, and they feed it through them throughout the year, it's going to make them very acidic. So that stuff's all full of grain. Um, cows and goats are ruminant animals, so you don't want to feed them too much grain. It makes their rumen acidic. So then more diseases and things learn to survive in an acidic environment. and. Um, it just is an unhealthy product in the end. It's also made to fatten them up faster, so they make a faster turnaround on their um, profit. Which doesn't let them grow the way they're supposed to. Right. Just so, slower and just build, build muscle tissue and stuff. Yeah, when, when, yeah, everything here is really slow. So like our pigs, that's Rosie and one of her litters from last fall, but... Um, <coughs> Like those are our Tamworth breed pigs. You're, you're never going to find any kind of pork like that at Myers. This is a heritage breed pig. It's originally from Europe. Um, it was made to be very hardy, last long, uh, good foraging ability, good mothering skills, um, just healthy, healthy animals. So our pigs take a year. Um, if you were going to go to an industrial operation, they can raise pigs in like four to five months to a butcher weight. Yeah. And they're also all grain fed. Our pigs um, eat hay. You, you <laughs> try to give hay to someone else's pigs, and they're going to look at that and be like, I'm not eating that. Yeah, they'll, use it, they'll, they'll, use it for, they'll use it for bedding right. or whatever. They'll, yeah. They eat it. We feed them to our, our 16 pigs that we have over there that we're raising up for this for fall. people for this fall. And yeah, yeah they mow down hay. Yeah. They'll go to the hay almost before. We still ration them yeah. some grain to help get the, you know, keep them fed up, especially for winter time. Yeah. Helps keep them warm. Yeah. But, um, They'll go for the hay first over the over like the corn and stuff yeah. like that. So it's pretty pretty amazing. Yeah. There's a lot of people that are actually convinced that you can't feed pigs hay. They just won't won't be able to live anymore. <laughs> yeah, well, we, yeah, we know some uh, guy actually bought some pigs from us. That's that's all he feeds. Is hay? Yeah, he grows he grows his own hay and um, he feeds them round bales all year and he. Yeah. Um, which is great. I mean, I wish there was more people that do that, but other I wish people, we could do that more yeah, like that if we had too. more property to do hay, we definitely would, but we get all our hay from a local guy right up in Montague, and um, he's a great guy. So, let's see. Hey, Crystal, can you yeah. explain why the hay is better than the green? Um, because I'll, I do have a couple slides that explain that more, but when you have a grass-fed animal, um, they're getting a lot more nutrients from the from the grass so the root system in natural grasses taps way down I mean if you ever have seen examples of today's agriculture and like perennial agriculture the root systems on today's agriculture is like in the first foot or two of the soil or layer. Less, or less, yeah, yeah so they're um, very not <coughs> drought tolerant and if your crops are always tapping into that same soil layer there's nothing left in there anymore you know there's no good nutrients and vitamins in there so if you look at perennial grasses, they tap way down into um, the water table level and they pull out all these vitamins and nutrients and then the animal comes and eats it and in turn goes into their meat and their fat, which is very important. And if you're eating grain, you're just not getting the same benefits. Um, like I said, and grain also makes them really acidic um, and unhealthy. You know, if you were it's usually just, just to fatten them up. I mean, a lot of grain. Yeah, grain, yeah. yeah, that's all yeah. carbs. All you know, carbs. Sugar, yeah, carbs. Sugar, carbs. Sugar, really yeah, which turns to sugar. And, on, yeah. Like she said before, sugar is a major <coughs> effect, you know, yeah. inflammation, all that stuff. So they're not going to be a healthy animal. Right. Um, like this right here, this is what would be inside those um, big confinement houses big confinement for things. pork. So this is called a, um, this is what they would farrow pigs in so that they can't turn over and roll onto the litter and, and smush the piglets. So we don't do that. Our pig, pigs have, you know, um, an innate intelligence not to do that. And it's really amazing if you watch um, within like two days, I would say, um, after the piglets are born, you watch them. <clears throat> they know when the mom's getting ready to lay down and all move out of the way. Yeah, and then the milk bar is open and they all go <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we, we call it the milk bar because they all line up. And, 
but so this is what's going to be. So the mothers don't even get to you know enjoy their, their litters or anything. You can't even roll over yeah, it. Can. You can see there's some feces in the bottom corner of the picture. So yes, these are our tamworth pigs. That's uh, has Ruby and Rosie and then um, some of their piglets from I think two years ago now. But probably yeah. yeah. It's kind of amazing. They're, they're quite a bit bigger than that now. Yeah. They look small in that picture. <laughs> yeah, but, um, if you've ever seen our pigs, too, they have a whole different build. They're really um, long and lean, and most pigs today are, are, are they're longer, but they are they got more of the belly, and they're just fatter. Mm -hmm. I've had people say, and your pigs are skinny. You're like, no, that's what they're supposed to look like. Yeah, they're not supposed to be dragging their bellies on the ground. And, <coughs> so. and Tamworths have this really long nose. And it's kind of curved. It's, it's made for rooting, like they're supposed to do. Some people put rings in the nose to prevent that, but that's what pigs are made to do, and they're really good at it. It's amazing how fast yeah. they can. Yeah. Rode into the area. Yeah, yeah. So, but uh, they find garbage out here all the time, yeah. glass bottles and dig up all kinds of stuff. But they really like sassafras roots and acorns. Grubs. And grubs, mm -hmm. all kinds of stuff. So. Yeah, so that's uh, industrial, and they and they always dock the tails too. You see, all these pigs have their tails cut off. And that's because when they're in these big pens, they get so bored. There's nothing to do in here besides eat, and also they chew each other's tails off all the time. <coughs> and we don't dock tails. Um, these are our dairy goats, uh, sassafras, and this is Bella, and then Athena's in the back here. So. Um, it's really interesting to watch the goats out in the pasture because um, goats are actually browsers, not grazers. So the difference is that they kind of pick here and there. Um, if you watch the sheep out in the pasture, they really go for the grass. They're yeah. grazers. Yeah, they're like a lawnmower. They're like a lawnmower. <laughs> um, the goats, on the other hand, really love brush. Um, lots of weedy, invasive species. They love pretty much any invasive species that we have. That's what they go for. And there's even certain things they wait to eat it until it flowers, so that's really interesting too. Um, but yeah, so in our goats, um, the only grain they get is when they're in milk and they're on the milk stand. They get steamrolled oats and then um, they get um, sunflower seeds. So that's just to make sure that they have enough calories. Um, when they're in milk, they burn a lot more calories. So. And this is uh, becoming a new big thing now is um, since a lot of people are having reactions to cow's milk, um, now they're going more towards the goat milk dairies. These are all sanins. And these goats are all disbudded too. So if you ever seen an actual sanin goat with its horns, this is a Swiss breed, so they would have you know big tall horns that go way back. If you've ever seen disbudding, it's not a very this process. Basically, yeah. you take a hot iron, hot iron and they're about three days old, and yeah, you, you burn days. the um, <clears throat> burn holes in their head until you get to the horn bud, and then you pick it off. So it's not not very. Which, cool. We don't do that here. Yeah, we don't do that. <laughs> we have. If you see our goats, our males and stuff, they have. Um, most of them are disbudders, but we we're just getting yeah. started buying them from people. Yeah. But. It, it's a it's an integral part of their head. If you yeah. look at, it, I mean, there's like a Big concave indent. indent on the back of their head, which where there would be horns. Where there would be horns, yeah. and, and just like uh, if you heard like rabbit's ears, there you know it's a cooling system. Yeah. There's all a whole bunch of nerves. That's the same thing that they're using. It. It's, a, it's a cooling <coughs> system for their head. And, this and, and that's that. also really their only defense. You know, if, if a coyote or something were to come, or even like a stray dog, you know, to come when we're not home and come out there, they don't have anything left. I mean, their horns are are like prevention that they have. Yeah. So. I mean, it's people do it because they think it's going to hurt them. Yeah. I mean, I if you look at them, they're curved back. They're not for stabbing you. Yeah. They're for just defense Defense or back scratching. They yeah. like to scratch their backs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's actually really or pull down tree branches. They'll yeah. hook their horns on them and pull them down. So it's yeah. a major, it's an integral tool of their body to survive. Yeah, I see that um, our girls that are disbudded all the time, you see them and they're like all like they're this. They're phantom scratching. They're, yeah, because they're trying to scratch themselves but they can't, so they're just kind of like flopping their ears around their back. It's really sad, so I always just try to go over there and just scratch them, you know, so. But you can see, look at the color of the feed that these goats are eating. There's not really much color to that feed. This is just like a, they're doing the new goat systems just like the cow systems, you know, so eventually people aren't going to be able to drink the goat's milk either. Yeah, it's not going to taste nearly as good. 
Um, these are our cows. So we get these guys, um, we do get them as dairy calves, but um, after that we raise them really well. Yeah, they're only, usually when we get them, they're only about a week old. This is, yeah. this is our for um, beef that yeah. we raise at, um, at the moment. It's on appropriate diet. So in the summer <coughs> they are grazing and then in the winter we get the local hay that they eat. They don't get any grain at all. Um, we do get like uh, from Bodhi Tree Juice Company, we get the barrels of the juice pulp and they love <coughs> that stuff. I mean, uh, there's a lot of ginger in there from their switchel, uh, just carrot pulp, all kinds oranges, of pulp. Oranges, orange peels. Yeah, they love orange peels and lemons, mm -hmm. which is really good for their rumen to make it more alkaline. Our goats love that too. <coughs> so, let's see. This is a conventional dairy system. Um, and, the, and the guy that we used to get our dairy calves from has since gone out of business because uh, the dairy system right now is so cutthroat with the pricing. So he was getting a dollar twenty a gallon, which is you know nothing. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at the operating cost of a place like this, it's crazy. I mean, the tractors are three hundred thousand dollar tractors, and you're getting a dollar twenty a gallon for for your milk. Um, another thing that I wanted to talk about <coughs> is um, today's like cows themselves. So um, we used to have a milk cow because we wanted to try out the difference between um, goat milk and cow milk and we decided we liked our goat milk a lot better. But a good milk cow, like a homestead milk cow, you know, to us is like three to five gallons a day. That's pretty good milk cow. Um, the guy that we used to get our dairy calves from, an average um, cow on his farm was 10 gallons per day. That's just a crazy amount of milk. There's no way that a calf could even ever drink that much milk. Yeah. So what I'm trying to say is that they've just been um, bred, you know, genetically for so long to produce mass amounts of milk. It's just the the end product isn't even good anymore. Yeah. You know, it's just it's, so much it's quantity. Mostly water. Yeah, so much quantity. There's not no quality, no quality in it. Yeah. Um, did they give him like hormones and stuff to keep the milk? Going? No, I'm not. He didn't. He didn't give him any no. hormones. But um, if you go there, they have all these semen books all the time. So it'll 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 be artificial. different brands of semen that you can buy because it's genetics, all artificially inseminated now. You know, nobody right. actually has bowls anymore. So you, you and, it, and like each straw of semen will, will say you know like the average amount of heifers that are in that semen or or the butterfat content, you know, so they just buy the straws and inseminate the cows and then you just kind of keep breeding that way until you get what you're looking for. So, yeah. Mm. Um, some of our heritage um, chickens, so um, just all different heritage breeds. Um, I wanted to, I'm getting kind of all over the place here, but there's a, a spot in here where I talk about the important part of heritage. So, <clears throat> so the definition of the word heritage is valued objects and qualities such as cultural traditions, unspoiled countryside, and historic buildings that have been passed down from previous generations. So heritage and heirloom means to us quality and flavor. It is also proven that both heritage breed and heirloom produce have higher concentrations of vitamins, minerals, important fats, and are easier for your body to process. On our farm, we raise heritage breeds of livestock. <coughs> heritage breeds of livestock were not developed to make people the most money and grow the fastest. They are developed and maintained to be a standalone, healthy animal. They are hardy and have great natural instincts to mother their young and forage their own food. Heritage breeds started to um, to fall out of popularity when industrial agricultural in, agriculture, agriculture. <laughs> moved in. Heritage breeds are seen to be unsuitable for industrial agriculture due to their slow growth rates and overall less productive nature. <clears throat> it says, have you ever tasted a homegrown heirloom tomato compared to a store-bought greenhouse tomato? <coughs> it's pretty obvious to tell the difference. If you go to Myers right now and got a tomato, it wouldn't really taste like anything. <coughs> Uh, it says, the same can be said with the difference in heritage breed livestock versus industrial raised livestock. The taste and quality are unmatched and easily noticeably different. Um, so like our, our pork meat is way more red than what you're going to see 
um, at, at the grocery store, and a lot of people are like, why is this meat so weird looking? <laughs> well, it's not weird looking, that's what it's supposed to look like. The stuff you're used to getting at the grocery store is the unnatural stuff. Um, and then like uh, the, the chicken fat coloring is, is if, you, if you get chicken at Myers, it's, it's white and there's hardly any fat on it anyway, but chicken fat is not supposed to be white. Let's see here. So this would be like an industrial hen house, um, just, you know, in these wire cages. And you ever notice how like uh, whales in SeaWorld, their fins are always flopped over? If you, if you look at a lot of these hens, you can see that their combs are all flopped over, so they're not happy in here. And then also what they do is they cut, cut their beaks off and burn them um, so that they can't peck each other, which is very painful. I mean, if somebody cut your fingertips off and, and soldered them, that would hurt, you know, so. So um, our chicken coop is, you can't see it now, but we built it ourselves. It's our big green one and it's on wheels, so we move it around usually like every two weeks or so in the summer. summer. Right, right now it's in the same spot because obviously there's snow on <laughs> We can't move it, but um, we do still supplement them with lots of good things. We get um, Lively Up Kombucha, which is brewed right in Muskegon. We get um, like buckets of scobies and the chickens go crazy for those. Mm -hmm. So this would be a, a free range house here. So there's no cages, but there's not really much room for anybody to move around in here. And I was gonna also point out, if you've noticed yet, that a lot of the industrial animals are all white. There's no color here. These are our Freedom Ranger broilers on pasture. Um, so we do, these are our meat chickens. So we raise them on pasture. Um, we'll get our first batch in like March, and then we usually harvest like June or July. But um, lots of good clover in here, um, different fescues and rye grasses. Um, they go crazy for that stuff. When we have them out in the field, uh, we move those pens every day. So they'll leave behind their um, really nitrogen-rich manure, which helps the grass grow back really <coughs> fast and vibrant. And then um, when we move them, they'll eat all this down. And Bugs, grasshoppers, it's yeah. watching them chase them down. Worms. <laughs> Worms, yeah. yeah. They, it's like they're ready. They're yeah. When we come out there to move them, they're like yeah. chomping yeah. at the bit to get to the yeah. next area. It's like, all right, yeah. finally we get to move. <laughs> so this would be a free range broiler house. There's not much room in here, bad air quality, and again, uh, same white chickens. Uh, I mean, a lot of local farms, even on a small scale, like if you wanted to do your own broilers, you could go to Tractor Supply when they have their chick days, and you could get this breed of chicken. And Cornish crop. <laughs> but I, um, we don't use that breed of chicken because that's the industrial standard, and we don't want to raise that breed of chicken. I mean, we can raise it on pasture, it would be a little bit better, but it's not going to, because of its fast growth rate, it's not going to be as healthy as a slower growing yes, broiler. Um, was it six six weeks? Six you can weeks butcher that chicken. You can have a chicken. Wow. Oh, five, yeah. five pounds. If, you know, if five they pounds. If, long, if they yeah. last that long, they do have chrome. Yeah, heart heart failure. Yeah, we they our don't, first, can't walk very well. Yeah, our first year we did a sample batch of yeah. Cornish cross and a sample batch of Freedom Rangers, and we've never grown these since because they were just really unhealthy. Um, if you even look at the way they walk, they just walk a whole Waddle. different way. Yeah, they walk. <laughs> um, because everybody likes their breast meat, so these chickens are, are grown to have really big breasts, so they just can't even walk straight up like chickens should. They're more like slumped over. Um, and they always um, have bumblefoot, which is an infection. Like on the bottom of the foot, it'll be just a big infection from all the weight. Um, sometimes uh, they, they have just heart attacks and they'll just be dead <laughs> in there. And a lot of times when we would process these, um, you, you would cut, it, cut them open to eviscerate them and a bunch of yellow liquid would come out and the livers would always look um, really pale. And then sometimes also around the heart there would be like a sack of fluid, like their heart was under stress, you know. So, um, yeah, I mean even if you're getting organic chicken from a store or something, it's still going to be the same breed of chicken, so it can only be so good. So is the price you're paying for your organic Cornish cross broiler really worth it, or should you go to 
um, you know, a more local farm and, and find something even better. And two, I mean, organic, anything with organic label on it is only going to be as good as, as the standard, you know, which is all government regulated. Um, so, and right now a lot of organic standards are being lowered because there's a lot more money going into organic right now. You know, everybody's got health issues, they all want to know how to get healthy, how to get better. So maybe they'll try out this organic thing, you know, and <clears throat> go buy themselves some organic meat. But um, even on just different other things besides meat, you know, uh, produce and, and uh, I don't know, chips or grains, you know, we put an organic label on there. But, you know, even with the grains, you're still dealing with super hybrid grains, you know. So, like I say, the root systems are still really short. Um, and it's just not going to be as high quality as if you, if you searched out a more um, <coughs> heritage breed or heirloom product. Uh, we raise Katahdin hair sheep. Uh, they're, they're super um, parasite resistant, um, so we've never had to worm our sheep. If you know anything about um, agriculture, then you know that parasite resistance is a really big issue. Um, so uh, we used to use um, chemical wormers in the beginning with our goats um, just because when you when you get a goat from someone else's farm um, that's been chemically wormed it's really I mean parasites can kill a goat in like a week yeah quick. Uh, it's crazy goats are really sensitive animals uh, just their whole system I mean uh, if, if they're not feeling good they can fade away really fast so when they're used to being wormed with these chemicals and you try to put them on a more natural um, thing or just even the stress of moving them to a different farm can make the parasites really set in and, and they can go downhill really fast. So with our goats um, we've had to kind of transition them over a little bit more but all the goats that we've had born here we've never had to worm because they're accustomed to you know our land and, and our forage and just our routine in general. Um, but if, if I was to um, worm uh, let's say one of my goats now with a chemical wormer uh, my vet would recommend for me to use triple the amount recommended on the bottle and use it for twice the period recommended on the bottle because um, most goats are resistant to all wormers on the market. It's kind of like antibiotics now, you know, things, they, they learn how to survive, you know, like uh, Monsanto's um, GE corn, they, they made that with the, um, the BT uh, directly in the corn, so when the and when the corn grubs would go to eat the corn, um, it would kill them. But they learned how to eat that and survive. So now they've moved on to, you know, just continually adding in different chemicals and things to yeah, try heavy to... Heavy spraying. Yeah, heavy spraying. Um, but, you know, it, that's just not how it works. So when you use the herbal wormers, the worms never um, develop a resistance to them. It takes, it takes, you know, more commitment. You have to do it on a more regular schedule. Um, more regular basis so part of the chemical side of things is also convenience you know I just do it one time and oh it's all done you know, I don't worry about it for I don't know months or, yeah. or whatever when you're doing a, a more herbal wormer you have to do it on a weekly basis so you have to just be more aware and, and you know get more in tune with things more involved but all, the, all that is is just herbs um, like yeah. it, sm it smells like an herb mix that you would use to rub your meat or something like that yeah. out there it's, yeah, the garlic and wormwood. Yeah, and clove. Clove and stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it smells pretty good, actually. Yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's just, it's easier. It's just, any, you know, stuff you can find out, yeah. you know, in the garden or whatnot. Yeah, yeah I could grow, and I grow some wormwood, and the goats like it, but you can't give it to them while they're pregnant because it can cause them to abort uh, their pregnancy. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> So this would be industrial sheep. This is a polypay breed. Um, so this would also contribute to the wool industry. These um, sheep have fleece. Um, our sheep do not. They shed every year like a dog, you know. Um, so you can see it's just like feedlot beef here. There's no grass here. These sheep are all being fed grain to, to get fat fast and go to market. Uh, we raise um, uh, broad, uh, bronze turkeys, and um, we actually free range our turkeys out front um, once they're large enough. So, and then we just put them in their pens at night. They come right back, and they'll go in there. 
Oh, we call them. Usually they come. Yeah, they usually, they usually come. Yeah, they, yeah, they get accustomed to you. They're a lot more personable yeah. than a chicken. Yeah. And, um, uh, yeah, which we supplement them just like our um, our broilers. We do have like a non-GMO um, soy feed, free. soy free yeah. feed that we feed them. Yeah, but during the day, they're on pasture getting bugs, worms, all that stuff, just like yeah. the meat or chickens. Yeah. So. Crystal, you yes. mentioned how big your one turkey was last year. Oh, that was a pet turkey. Uh, <laughs> it was, I mean, it we, was yeah, big. We, yeah, big. We, yeah. 32 pounds. Yeah. Just oh. <laughs> it's pretty big. So um, these turkeys are industrial turkeys. These are uh, um, broad-breasted white turkeys. So same thing as your um, Cornish cross chicken. And they all have their beaks cut off, you can see in the picture. Mm -hmm. And there's, you know, no room in here for anything. And same same white coloring on these turkeys. So these are all your butter balls. And, and, and um, if you look into this kind of meat, too, it all has traces of different chemicals in it. I mean, arsenic and all this kind of bad stuff from all the feed that they're eating and all the, um, you know, bad sourcing that they do. They just want to fatten this bird up as fast as they can and get it to market. Our turkeys take five to six months um, to get to about, our, our average weight is about 15 pounds. Yes. And we harvest them here, we pluck them here. I mean, they don't leave, nothing um, that we grow leaves the farm um, alive. We harvest everything here. So that's important because it causes an animal a lot of stress to put it on a truck and transport it to a USDA facility and then you don't even know if you're getting your bird back or how it died or anything like that. I mean that's a really important part. If you're going to put all this groundwork into it and then just ship it somewhere else to have somebody do that part, that's not, that's not uh, how we do things here. <laughs> well, we have a little roadside stand. I'm sure a lot of you have seen it, but we, we try to keep it stocked up as good as we can. Um, we, we have stuff out there, usually spring through fall. And uh, this picture is just to show, so like the stuff on our stand is not going to look perfect, but it's all edible. Um, all the stuff you see at the grocery store is all, look, look how pretty this looks, you know. Um, it's all shiny and there's no bruises on anything and, you know, yeah. it's just perfect. Yeah, it's not that, how produce is supposed to look. Yeah, all that bruise stuff probably got thrown thrown away, yeah. which is a major problem. Half yeah. the stuff that's in the <coughs> store, they, we used to get some from a grocery store. Yeah. They threw away a lot of stuff yeah. and it's just we, like, what in the world? You know, yeah. what are you doing with all this stuff? Yeah. Throwing away. Trunk loads of melons and just all kinds of crazy things. Um, you know, your sweet potato gets a little mark on it. Nobody's going to want to buy that one, so throw that one away. Your wrinkly peaches or, or whatever, you know, so just really wasteful. Now we have a little farm store. Um, it's self-serve, and um, I think a lot of you guys have been in there before, but um, just for kind of convenience, because um, a lot of times we just don't have time to show people around everywhere. Or, we're, we're pretty busy, so that's just kind of a way to help ourselves, too, and, and offer um, good things in there. Let me see. I just want to make sure I kind of went through everything. And kind of get some of your questions and stuff yeah. so you guys can get home or whatever. If, you yeah. get, if it's getting too late or whatever, so we kind of wrap it up. Yeah, so I just wanted to, um, when did what's considered normal in today's society become what is today known as conventional agricultural? Um, also known as industrial agriculture, referring to farming systems which include the use of synthetic chemical fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides, and other continual inputs, genetically modified organisms, concentrated animal feeding operations, heavy irrigation, intensive tillage, or concentrated monoculture production. And monoculture is like, you know, when you go by a cornfield and it's all corn or, or soy fields, all soy, that, that gives parasites or any kind of um, like disease, a good opportunity to um, be able to kill off that whole cornfield yeah. because it's all that's all it's there is corn. When you're dealing with a monoculture, it's a lot more easy for disease and stuff to really take advantage. Yeah, especially yeah, if you do it year after year, yeah. it knows what it's going to have to go after. And yeah, like. Eat. If, if I planted my potatoes in the same spot every year, I'd have so many potato bugs on there that it would just become an infestation. Yeah. 
and the nutrients would be right the plant, yeah. yeah if they make if the plants even make it they'll kill the plants so despite its name conventional agriculture methods have only been in development since the late 19th century and did not become widespread until after World War II, and I put like one Monsanto needed more money because if you know anything about Monsanto, that's um, they created a lot of chemicals for, for the war. So after the war was over, they needed to find a new market. Um, so we have events. We have a couple open farms a year. We have um, farm to table dinners. Um, so this was one of our spring open farms that we had. This is one of our um, dinner events that we hosted on the farm last year. This was our ox roast. Um, so and look at the coloring of the meat on this on this beef. On the fat. Yeah. yeah. The fat. Or the, yeah, the fat. That's what yeah. That's what it would get from pasturing our animals and stuff like that. If you just did it by feeding them grain stuff would be pretty white. Or I just want to read this a minute because it's important. So U.S. consumers prefer beef with white fat as compared to yellow fat. So that is the major reason the packing plants purchase grain finished beef. The U.S. consumer viewing a meat display of beef products in the supermarket is not accustomed to selecting and purchasing meat that does not have white fat and has difficulty selecting meat that is off color or contains yellow fat. The major cause of yellow fat is the intake of the yellow <coughs> carotenoid pigment, <laughs> especially B-carotene, which can be metabolized to vitamin A. Um, a yellow colored fat, I'm oh, sorry, a vitamin essential to many body processes. Um, excess B-carotene is, is stored in fat, giving rise to a yellow colored fat. Grass forages are the major, major source of carotenoid pigments finishing diet for beef cattle contain mostly grain and very little forage. Um, it says Iowa State has conducted studies on feeding and marketing um, Cole's cows. Their data suggests that it takes between 70 and 90 days to change yellow fat to white fat. Most feedlot cattle would be on a high grain finishing diet for at least 90 days. Uh, we, we also do like photo shoots and just different fun <coughs> events. So this is a picture I wanted to share. <laughs> uh, and then if you are interested in ordering, you can you know call, text, email, or stop over. I think everybody got a copy of our brochure. Kind of goes over some pricing information, how we raise everything. Um, if you had any more questions, you could just contact us. Does anybody have any questions? No. Okay. <laughs> I got one. Uh, you got a you question? Get, did you get your tractor fixed? Not yet. <laughs> We're working on it. Yeah. And then if you guys want to read this over, there's a lot of information in here about, you know, GMOs, gene splicing, biotech technology, and what that all involves, um, glyphosate. Um, so, yeah. I have a question. Yeah. On your sheet. So, I'm assuming then that that's also an arrow in the green. Yeah. Sheet. And then what do you do with them? I mean, what are you breathing for? Or for meat. Your part? Oh, for okay. meat, yeah. We don't, um, like, yeah. So all of our animals are heritage breeds. Um, so like our Katahdin sheep, we raise for meat because they don't produce wool. You could, if, if you picked up their shed, you could use it for, like, needle felting and things like that. But you couldn't make, like, sweaters and stuff out of it. Yeah. So. And our goats are like triple purpose, uh, milk, meat, um, yeah, we sell the kids to other oh, yeah, people that kids, want a homestead. Yeah. Homestead or 4-H, um, yeah. stuff like that. And actually Elsie's been <coughs> taking some of our hides, she wants to learn how to tan, so that's pretty cool. <laughs> Thanks for the help. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, do you want to add anything? I do. Um, I just want to uh, express um, how lucky you are to be in a community that provides this kind of quality food. If, there, if I don't think many of you are new to this, but what Crystal and Lee are talking about is the difference between feeding your body something that will actually nourish it and, and give you life, as opposed to eating something that you then have to turn around and get it out of you mm -hmm. by getting the toxins out. And I just want to encourage you if you don't already, to utilize them, and if you're from far, far away, come get it or find somebody who's close to you. 
I also want to encourage you to think about um, your symptom and the thing that's ruining your life. I want you to know how lucky you are to be in a community that provides the things that you're hearing tonight. People think of lucky as, okay, you're walking down the street, somebody shoots a, a gun at you and it misses your head by a foot. Now that's lucky. That's really that's lucky. Right. <laughs> you agree? If that's yeah. lucky. But I want you to know how lucky you are to be in a community where you don't have to drive three and a half hours to go get something done to help your body. You don't have to drive way up to Fremont, and there's nothing wrong with that, but it's right here in your community. And so we come here to, to do something to wake you up, to help wake you up to what's going on. We're being... Um, Bamboozled, is that the right word? We're being bamboozled by commercialism where they feed our kids and they feed us stuff that looks pretty and is cheaper. And you're, you're going down the street and you're learning that, gee, maybe I do have uh, a heart issue. Um, you need to be, to be aware of what, the, what commercialism and the mainstream medicine is, is saying to you and feel very fortunate that you have the likes of this without tooting our horns. You're fortunate <laughs> yeah, I mean, to be you, in this community. If you listen to what your doctor is going to tell you, they're going to tell you the opposite of what we're trying to tell you, yeah. basically. Um, but there's a reason that you know people can go to Myers and, and grab some cow's milk and they have you know gut aches and then they come here and grab our goat's milk and, and they're perfectly fine. I mean, there's, there's a reason behind that and people don't realize how how much corn and soy and, and, and chemicals are in you know their food that they get from the store. Um, it, it makes a big difference when you buy clean food. You know, yes. Your body is already so burdened, like Pamela was saying, with dealing with everything else that you know, adding on top of that the food is just too much. Mm -hmm. So Crystal put out some really cool books out yeah. there for people. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. To look at snacks, 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 some in the freezer. Yeah. Freezer. Yeah, I'll grab them out. Oh, okay. right. And then, if anybody has an interest in doing a two-minute check, um, I'm right back here. If you do, come line up here. And we'll go in the back.